But today I want to do something that's both very simple and very complex. I want to talk about something um, that we talk about every day that is ordinary for us. That is a term that we use every day, the term that we are surrounded, surrounded by to the point where sometimes we don't see it anymore. And that's the concept of evil. Uh, nothing could possibly be more relevant to our age because evil, now we're not talking about error. We're not talking about good hearted people being mistaken. We're not talking about people being well intentioned. We're talking about a regime that is aware at some level that it's destructive. That it's what we call asset stripping. It knows that its time is running out. So it needs to suck as much value out of the system as humanly possible. There's no reason to create anymore because everything is on a very short-term basis. And um, as we come rushing to the end, um, evils manifest in the fact that there is no actual creativity. There's no actual production. The entire regime is based on manipulation and sucking as much value, whatever's left, from the capital that remains as quickly as possible, because pretty soon it's going to come crashing down. I've said on this show many times before, and I've said it with uh, Sven on Thursdays, that one of the biggest growth industries in the upper class is bunkers. Those companies that specialize in um, uh, underground fortresses for the very wealthy have seen their business go up over 300%, since March. But we use terms like evil, we use terms like love, even terms like sin and, and law, um, often without having really any idea what we mean by it. And in a society that uses words deliberately for the sake of deception and not for information, this becomes more and more important. But we have to start, like with everything else, we have to start with Plato and, and St. Augustine. Uh, the Platonic movement, which is the foundation of, of European culture. It's the foundation of thought. It's the foundation of Christianity. Um, but Plato, prior to the Christian vision, although absolutely necessary to it, um, says, as most of you know, that e evil comes from a disordered soul. It's a psychological matter. It's the domination of the passions, the domination of, of desire over reason. Passions force us to do things, as the root passion suggests. So if we're not careful over time, they become a habit, and then these become very hard to break. That's the definition of a vice. What men will do for sex, for example, shows that this disordered soul can't be denied. The irrational things that men will do, the things that women do to themselves for the sake of attention... Passion can't be denied. Evil can't be denied as, as this is as a foundation. But the Greek root, apaxio, is, is um, to feel extraordinary emotion, especially suffering. The very root of the word passion is to be affected. Experiencing feeling uh, in the most intense way, it's, it's negative. To be passionate about something is to suffer. And we get the word passive, we get the word patient from it. Because a person is not acting, he's being acted on. Um, so for St. Augustine, the order of the soul was critical. It's the same as Plato. Evil is the preference for created things over uncreated things. Putting your faith in the transitory, the mutable, um, is identical to idolatry. Now, Plato says the same thing, although they put it, of course, in, in very different terms. In the Roman era... Um, just prior to St. Augustine, Cicero defined it as to gain at someone else's expense. Natural law, on the other hand, was a virtue. It's to sacrifice for someone else's benefit. This became the central idea of not just the Republic, but also the Roman Empire. But all these classical ideas are still alive. The Church has taken them. Uh, the Protestant Reformation, of course, destroyed them all. But both in East and West, the Roman and Stoic ideas uh, remained. Um, 
But exogenous causes still are stressed, you know, mental problems, abuse of childhoods, no moral guidance, social decay, inequality. The agent is seen as a tool of these forces. Many of you have heard me refer to George Florosky, who died in 1979, a Russian writer who was at Harvard for a long time. He spent a long time dealing with creation. Um, and of course, evil is connected to the idea of creation and, and reality, the ontological structure of everything that is. Modern people don't see creation in moral terms. They see the external world as dead matter that can be shaped by machines into whatever we want. That's the modern enlightenment. But Florosky's view became very influential. Um, and they, re they revolve around, I, I listed anyway, as seven specific propositions. Um, first of all, the world is contingent. It has no reason for being except that God created it freely. It contains what he calls metaphysical evil in its contingency, that it need not be, and it will soon go away. The second thing is creaturehood, to be a creature is that creation is ontologically separate from God, but not unrelated to him. It's related to God in the sense that an artist is related to his painting. The work of the art isn't the artist per se, but of course in his handiwork it bears his imprint everywhere. Thirdly, creation contains spirit, which of course is man's free will. Uh, universal truths, universal forms. Uh, forms are spiritual things. Um, ideas and archetypes, by definition, can't be material, because truth can't change. St. Augustine says that mathematical realities being objective prove God's existence, because it proves that immutable truths exist, and therefore the spirit exists. And a spirit exists, spirit has to have a source. A source of spirit has to, in fact, be spirit. Fourth, God creates solely out of his own goodness. He desires freely that much of his energy and attributes be manifested in nature as physical thing. Five, God acts within and is, in a sense, imminent in creation. It's the idea that Logos, the second person in the Trinity, is a content of the Father's will, an aspect of the structure of the world. Now, that's the energies of God, not his essence, which is a very abused distinction. Every New Orthodox convert uses these, these words. You know, but that's that's the, the basics of it. Six, objects have essences. Essences are the same thing as forms, eternal definitions, whatever you want to use, archetypes. This is the ancient view almost wherever you go. Each object has an essence that tells us what it is, what it's meant to do, what constitutes its specific perfection. So creation is good to the extent that objects in it follow their essence or their purpose. But nature is damaged, it's fallen, much as imperfect, but the goodness of creation, proper to the fall, was typified by the complete identity of objects with their essences. And finally, seven, all things are in God, not by nature, but by their image, which is another way of saying um, energy with the manifestations of energy. Now, these seven points are the foundation for understanding what creation is, and therefore what its negation is. The rest doesn't make any sense. St. Augustine, um, on true religion, he writes, he says the following, and this is, is more or less in, in, in verse form. I could speak at length without lying in praise of the worm. I could point to the brightness of its color, the smooth rounded shape, the way that the parts of its body suit each other, Strive to keep it in one piece, as far as it fits its humble nature. The soul of a worm makes it move in a well-ordered way. To seek whatever is good for it, to avoid or over overcome difficulties. Its soul, even more clearly than its body, suggests the unity that underpins all natures, as it directs everything at the sim single aim of keeping it safe. Now the old term for worms, that he means caterpillar. But the point is, to use a very small, humble being as a manifestation of Logos. Why is the worm so praiseworthy? Why is it even worth talking about? It's because of its order. Not only its internal order, which is extremely complex and delicate, the genetics alone can fill millions of volumes, 
but also its relation to the rest of creation. All in perfect balance, of course, that um, all things survive and possibly thrive. The worm has a soul, but by soul he means essence, that provides it with its reason, its reason for action. Reason for action in this sense is the same word as reason in the sense of our cognition. It attempts to fully realize its essence relative to itself. But all creatures have their part to play. And destruction would occur if even one were to disappear. St. Basil says in his Hexameron, Among those who have imagined that the world coexistent with God from all eternity may deny that it was created by God, but say that it exists spontaneously as a shadow of this power. God, they say, is the cause of it, but an involuntary cause, as the body is the cause of the shadow and the flame is the cause of the brightness. It's correct this error that the prophet states with so much precision, in the beginning, God created. He did not make the thing itself the cause of its existence. Being good, he made it a useful work. Being wise, he made it everything most beautiful. Being powerful, he made it very great. Moses also almost shows us the finger of the supreme artist in taking possession of the substance of the universe, forming the different parts in one perfect accord and making a harmonious symphony result from the whole. And that's um, from homily number one. And this is entirely distinct, of course, from the modern point of view. Creation is good because it's created. God is incapable of evil in the sense that he's incapable of non-being. He created natural beauty that's seen everywhere because he created order and balance. Which proves, of course, that nature could not have come into existence unless it came into existence all at once. Lest the imbalance destroy everything. That's why he uses the phrase harmony and symphony. And this is a central element in all early Orthodox concepts of creation, even prior to Christianity in, in, in Greece and Rome. And of course, they were reacting to the Gnostics, who claimed in a very broad sense that creation was deeply imperfect, and the God of the Old Testament was a totally different being than the God of the New. Which, of course, really is a modernist idea, because most of the churches, to the extent they're churches at all, reject the Old Testament. And they have no idea why um, it's even in there. Trying to explain to people why the Old Testament's in the Bible, even though it's much, much longer than the New. And the reason the reason they don't read it because it's very difficult, and it's very long, and it's very complicated. The New Testament seems to them very easy, so they could take one liner from it. And they think that that's the, that's the disaster of all of this. This is why the Church has the uh, authority of power. This is why Protestantism is such a disaster, because it said anyone could could read whatever they want. And somehow they got the idea that scriptures in the Bible were one and the same thing. Somehow the Bible just dropped from heaven fully made in their ignorance, um, having no idea of where this, where this came from. Um, now, evil, of course, is a negation of all of this. Evil is defined as that which resists God, which is the same thing as resisting being. St. Gregory of Nyssa says that evil is an unsown herb without seed and without root. It's a lack. It literally doesn't exist. That only begs the question. It doesn't exist in and of itself, but it's a lack of something. A lack of an essence, a lack of purpose. He says, one defines evil as nothingness. Certainly, evil never exists by itself, but only inside of goodness. Evil is pure negation, a privation, or a mutilation. Undoubtedly, evil is a lack, a defect. The structure of evil is antinomic. Evil is a void of nothingness, but a void which exists, which swallows and devours beings. Evil is powerlessness. It never creates, but its destructive energy is enormous. Evil never ascends, it descends. Evil is chaotic. It's a separation, a decomposition, constantly in progress, a disorganization of the entire structure of being. But evil is also, without doubt, vigorously organized. Everything in the sad domain of deception and illusion is amphibolic and ambiguous. That, by the way, was not um, Gregory of Nyssa, that was uh, Florovsky. So God didn't create this, of course. But since free will exists, and God doesn't compel anyone to love him, 
evil remains a possibility. What I just said, what Swarovski says, is the entire idea. Evil has an essence of a, of a specific, peculiar sort, but it's a void. Being, essence, purpose, light, logos, energy, they're all one and the same thing. It's the activity, the energies of God on earth. Um, but that doesn't really answer the question. How do we understand evil when we see it? Not as a, um, not as something that, that strikes us a certain way, but how can we define it? The first thing is that it is a lack of being. It's a lack of reality. Demons use images, fantasies, pictures to tempt people to sin. Images aren't real, but they are taken from parts of reality, put together in a way that's meant to pervert or invert its purpose. The rule of the Antichrist or the false prophet will rely on media for their rule. It's all based on images. We strive for things, whether it be money or power, all because we have an image in our mind of what it's going to be like to get it. None of that is real. We've invented it in our minds, and of course when we get it, if we ever get it, it's never that good. It's falsehood. It's, it's searching for something that does not exist because we've invented it, but we've also been given the parts of it from elsewhere. The priorities that we're told to have, which of course, none of which are real. But beyond that, the second thing is that it's destructive. It doesn't create. Images are nothing but composite fantasies that lead people to believe that some satisfaction exists in some passionate drive. Demons can't create. Sick people can't create. Moderns really can't create. They can only rearrange what's been created. That's why the Demiurgos is the great architect. The god of the Freemasons is the great architect. An architect doesn't create. It only rearranges what already exists. A third element, of course, is that it's chaotic. Creation is found in its order and balance. But since creation is contingent, this ballast can be upset. Fourth, this chaos comes from the separation of the thing from its true essence, its meaning and purpose. It's taking a good thing and using it wrongly, for all the wrong reasons. For Augustine, it's just a matter of error. So, for example, we believe that, say, getting married is going to make us happy, or even sex is going to make us happy. But then we find out that it's a heck of a lot more work than we expected. It never quite corresponds to our fantasy. We realize we have to deal with two people and building families and that the physical elements of it are just one very small part. It might be very exciting, but it's one aspect of a much larger whole. There's a lot of work and discipline involved. That is not, however, the image that we have. Eventually, it brings us to the knowledge of God because God alone is the only thing worth reaching for. Everything else, because of its contingency, is based on death and decay. So you have freedom, we desire a lesser good, an ontology, that nature is not a machine, it can be perverted in certain ways. So finally, evil is illusion and deception. It's the whole concept of images. They're not real. Images always contain enough reality to make us think they're real. It's hard for us to function for five seconds without having an image in our head of what we're going to do. Going to a certain place, meeting a certain person, um, accomplishing a certain feat. We do these things because we have an image in our mind of what life is going to be like once it's done. We fantasize about punching our boss in the face, but then we go out and do it. And as it turns out, the fantasy is not quite the reality. And even if we do punch him in the face, it might be fun, but we often break our hand, we get in a lot of trouble, and it's never as satisfying as we think it is. We go out and do whatever's necessary for these, these kind of fantasies, and it doesn't work out. You know, wealthy people are not happier than anyone else. In fact, they have more problems. Punching someone might be temporarily satisfying, sometimes even necessary, but it doesn't last very long. Evil is taking image for reality. It's believing that an image in your mind, planted there somehow, is actually what exists. An appearance is mistaken for essence. 
But it's a matter of will. We take the appearance for reality because we want to. We want the pleasure of being wealthy or popular or free from responsibility. Even though we know it's difficult, at least endless problems, and we're going to die anyway. But we, we pursue it nonetheless. St. John of Kronstadt writes in his spiritual diary, he says, As a Holy Trinity, our God is one being, although three persons. So likewise, we ourselves must be one. As our God is indivisible, we also must be indivisible. Though we are one man, one mind, one will, one heart, one goodness, but the smallest admixture of malice in a word, one pure love is God is love. Now there, the Holy Trinity is seen as moral aspect. Evil is the opposite. It's division. It's separateness. The Trinity is unity and diversity. Three beings, each independent, containing a single essence which defines them all. They differ only in the matter of their manifestation. The Son is generated from the Father, while the Spirit proceeds from Him, from, from the Father. All comes from the Father, all from the One. It's a single purpose, separate functions. That is not division. That is not separateness. They function together as one unit. So, as a society, as well as a, a, our individual souls, we're called to integrity. All of our functions and purposes should proceed from the same source, and deviation from this source leads to chaos and sin. God is alone the only rational end of human action. All else fails. It's temporary. It's mixed with pain, and it brings death. Now, um, some time ago, I wrote a brief article on Numbers 25. Again, an Old Testament book that very few people read. And even if they do read it, it's written in such a way that people don't really get too good out of it. It's, it's one of the most powerful, chapter 25, chapter 25 is one of the most powerful and relevant parts of the Old Testament. And I'm telling you now, the churches will do away with the Old Testament entirely. Numbers 25 is the microcosm of the, as the modern world. It's a very simple idea, and it shows a sect of Baal using women to lure Israelites away from their camp. It's so bizarrely close to our present circumstances, and what we've been talking about here, that it's, um, that it's, it's eerie. It's not cited by anyone, certainly not mainstream people, and we need to ask ourselves why. Now, it's, it takes place at Shittim, the meeting place between two nations, the Israelite and the Moabite. It might be noted that the same name, the location, the same location is the Hebrew for acacia, the tree, and a symbol used by the Masons. And the reason will be clear here in a minute. Now, we talked about images. We talked about the separation of image from reality. The allure of the female figure, as this author can attest, is almost impossible to ignore. The desire for it is immediate. It requires no concept to gain access to our mind. Yet the truths of the faith are just the opposite. They require thought. They require steps. The point is, is that the immediate drive for something is far more powerful than cognition, which is not immediate. It's immediate. All our reactions are rearguard actions in this sense. It's discouraging here to, to see how the truths of the faith, the truths of natural law, can never compare to one of these images especially a beautiful woman, or money or something like that. But in this case, in numbers, it's, it's, it's women. And it's how the pagans use the female form to destroy the church. How can a society dedicated to the god, which is austere and ascetic, upon, uh, respond to this? How can you possibly challenge a pagan world that's based entirely on this, on using this immediate um, fantasy image to control people. Now, the translations here um, differ. It's one of the few times where the translations are deliberate uh, in order to over, you know, to, to gloss over what the real meaning is here. This is the Good News translation. It says, When the Israelites were camped at Acacia Valley, the men began to have sexual intercourse with the Moabite women who were there. These women invited them to sacrificial feasts where the god of Moab was worshipped. 
The Israelites ate the food and worshipped the god of Baal of Peor. That is a deliberately manipulative translation. It's a deliberate attempt to obscure the meaning. It sounds like the elite of Israel were invited to a party. The notion of sacrificial offering includes the meal afterwards, but that's also glossed over. It was a form of communion with that society. It was initiation, right? The English word sacrifice comes from the Latin. And it comes to Latin is to make sacred. This means that something in the profane realm was now consecrated to the eternal realm with a spiritual one. It's about transformation. The destruction of the animal they ate was a representation of something being totally changed, either by burning it or eating it, or both. The meal that comes afterwards is a creation of oneness, since the sacrificed animals were now eaten in common. One thing was sacrificed to God, then it becomes a physical part of the community by ingestion. Now, sexuality was a means of disarming Israel, the church. The Moabites were a nation with its own interests that did not like the sight of this militant armed camp on the march. Learning about the asceticism of life in true Israel, they used but almost can not be denied, the male sex drug. The one weapon they knew they could use, the one weapon that the regime uses all the time. And remember, when I say Israel, I'm referring to Orthodoxy. I'm referring to the Israelites, the Old Testament church, and today. It's one entity. We're not talking about uh, modern Jews, which are the very opposite of Israel. We're not talking about the little country in the Middle East. We're not talking about this, you know, and at this point, if you think all that is one and the same, you need to go elsewhere for, you know, get, get the basics down first, then come back to this. But sexuality is a means of disarming Israel. The context here, of course, is Israel is on the march. They're marching into Canaan. They had just escaped the curse of Balaam. The land of Canaan was in view as they have left, of course, Egypt by this point, the end of the Exodus. They're just about to make their final drive into their God-given homeland, and their enemies now are desperate. The last ditch thing that they did was to use the male sex drive. Israel was victorious wherever it went, and this is why Numbers 25 is so absolutely essential. The point is, just before they were able to come into Canaan, the Moabites said, we're going to send women, and this will distract them. They'll end up competing with each other, uh, looking for their attention, they end up killing each other, which is what men tend to do um, when competing for a woman. But how do you fight against this? How do you match the ferocity of the male sex drive? How do you respond to this? And the only thing that's more powerful than the male sex drive is uh, superior physical violence. Nothing else can compare to it. The enemies of Zion here were throwing everything they had against Israel. The worship of the female body here is worse than any military defeat. It was a very attempt to corrupt the thought process of the people in their leadership. It might denote desperation, but the power can't be denied. The very term Moab is reference to the incestuous offspring of Lot's daughter. After Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for the sins of extreme indulgence, Lot and his daughter took refuge in a cave. The cave was always a symbol of female genitalia. Thinking that they were the only people left in the world, they had um, incestuous intercourse to keep the human line going in Genesis 19. Moab was one of the children of this uh, awkward incestuous copulation. Now, unlike the Ammonites, the Moabites were a settled advanced civilization. Because they come from incest, they were an unnatural uh, society. They were aware of how a woman's charms act like a drug. The Ammonites were a migratory people, and they could be done away with easily. But Moab, with functioning institutions, standing army, it remained throughout the Old Testament as the forerunner of the Antichrist. The Lord said unto Moses, here, this is a quote here directly from it, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them before the Lord and the Son, that the fierce anger of the Lord turn from Israel. The Lord said to Moses to kill them all. Their own people. Why? Why so extreme? Because it's the only thing that can compare and fight the intensity of the male sex drive, especially in this circumstance. The fear of death is the only thing that's stronger than that. And we all know it's true. Studies on the effect of pornography on American males show that exposure leads to the greater perception of the need for sex. It slowly replaces everything else. 
It gives the impression that sex is the strongest, most valuable human need. Over the last three decades especially, attractive women have presented themselves as sex objects. The fashion today is compared even to the 1980s. It's to use that as much as humanly possible. How can a Christian man be chased, especially a young man, when he's assaulted by thousands of women in yoga pants every day? When you compare the idea of a beautiful woman begging for your attention on the one hand, and the abstract canons of the church on the other, which is going to gain your, your enthusiastic attention first? We know the answer and that there's no exceptions to this. That's the essence of our problems. The immediate euphora of female attention can't compete with the purely conceptual, mediated truths of the church. You have a beautiful woman in front of you, the hell with the truth. And this is something that every man fully recognizes and understands. So in Numbers 25, Moab failed to destroy Israel militarily, so it approached it from a different direction, even more powerful than the army. This is why Moses panicked. As the libido of the Israelite elite was being deliberately provoked, these men then, as a result, began to uh, spend far more of their time trying to please these women than actually settling in Canaan. Many of these men were intensely infatuated with these new women, and these women were instructed, without question, to mirror the needs of these men, to make themselves perfect for them, so they, they would abandon Israel. In essence, they were agents. Their purpose was to get these men at their most weak point, get them to leave their wives, to abandon the faith, to come over to them, and they mirrored the most intense desires of the Israelite elite. This is why Moses had them hanged in the desert. But even later on, the prophecy of Malachi says, Judah has been faithless, an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob, for the man who does this, any witness or answer, or to bring an offering to the Lord of hosts. Moabites were foreigners. It wasn't just because they worshipped Baal, which means that their society was based entirely on lust, but because their very ethnic, their racial backdrop was formed under the guidance of these rules. That the enemies of Israel, in terms of their customs and language, not just in terms of their formal belief. Modern people see religion as a as a, at, at, at best a pleasant pastime. But the world before this system saw a culture deriving from the cult, which is where the word comes from. The main concern is that these women were permitting their bodies to be ravaged only at the price of the ritual obedience to these foreign based cultures. The Hebrew root here is Z and H. The, the root is to prostitute with strange gods. That's why things like prostitution, adultery, heresy, and the Old Testament, as well as in canons, are often used as one and the same thing. These men, now bewitched by the female agents, and in a trance that we all know very well, sacrifice the ball for the sake of these new relationships. The intense short-term gratification was consuming enough that it overrode their education, their dedication, and all their victories that have come before. This is what I mean very explicitly when I'm talking about the nature of evil and the nature of what an image is. Numbers 25 is ignored by pretty much everybody. Most people don't even know it existed. And yet it's... I mean, our, our ancestors certainly knew it existed. These... Uh, you know, the Old Testament was was how people learned to read. It was either Old Testament studies or the classics, Greece and Rome, usually both together, which is what education was based on up until the 20th century. So the story in Numbers 25 is a very clear one. They couldn't beat Israel militarily, so they needed to use something more powerful than their army, and that was their women. And it's not just that they were able to distract them or something. But these relationships, and they were fake ones because these women were, were trained to do this. It's that they began to change their opinions on things. Because the sex must have been great. They, they were flattered. They, 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 they were happy. They'd been on the march for so long out in the desert, leading an ascetic life with the absolute minimum of everything. 
These women were offering them the best of civilization. All of a sudden, quickly these men began to change their point of view. That's why they were executed. And that is the only thing. We're thinking these are, these are military men. These are young, fairly young men, uh, but well-trained men who should have known better. The opposite of all this, I mean, this is, this is chaos. This is living by these images. Numbers 25 is, is distinct only because these women were aware that they were doing nothing other than mirroring what these men wanted, what most men want. But the opposite of that is integrity. All functions proceed from the same source, and any deviation from that is evil. What was happening here was perversion through double-mindedness. This is equality of demons. Say one thing and mean another. Use language to confuse rather than present. Uh, or rather, you're confused rather than understand. Appearances are reality, and reality is only to be found in our perceptions and feelings. Demons cannot appear directly to chrismated people in their full identity, because we'd be repulsed. They can't show us who they really are, so they appear in fantasy images. Even holy figures and charismatic leaders, let alone things like sex and power. But it's all deception. It's all image in no substance. But what modern people, modern people have no background. They have no understanding. They have no idea how to tell one from another. And in fact, live in a society that says there is no difference. Appearances are all there. If that's how you're raised, then there is absolutely no way to judge what in front of you is real and what is pure image. We talked about the Trinity. That this is the very opposite of the use and deliberate manipulation of images for the sake of controlling people. So ultimately, evil is about overriding free will, because it has nothing to do with reason. St. Augustine says, By the Trinity, the supremely and equally unchangeably good, all things were created. And these are not supremely, equally, and unchangeably good, yet they are good, even taken separately. Taken as a whole, however, they are very good because their ensemble constitutes the universe and all of its wonderful order and beauty. And in the universe, even that which is called evil, when it's regulated and put in its place, only enhances our admiration for the good. For we enjoy and value the good more when we compare it with the evil. The Almighty God, who even as the heathen acknowledge, has supreme power over all things, being himself supremely good, would never permit the existence of anything evil among his works if he were not so omnipotent and good that he could bring good even out of evil. For those who understand what reality is, for those who understand natural law, the forms, uh, versus appearance, evil is something that, in fact, doesn't really exist for us. Suffering and pain are never really bad things, because as St. Augustine says, this is how we begin to rebuild, this is how we create something good and new. The Father is the source, the Son's manifestation, the Spirit, power, and presence of God on earth. Evil isn't Trinitarian, but it can be referred to this way. The Son is the faithful image of the Father. It contains all that the Father has. Now, the opposite, of course, is to be unfaithful, to reject what we've been given and demand something better. The Spirit manifests the, power, the Father's power on earth in action. The same can be applied to us. When we refuse the good, we tend to follow the images in falsehood. Dostoevsky says in the Brothers Karamazov, says, if a man ceases to believe in God, he does not believe in nothing, he believes in anything. It's used all the time, cited all the time, but what it means is that ideology, science, machinery, entertainment, these are all meant to take the place of meaningful and purposeful action. The Trinity is perfect faithfulness, perfect honesty and revelation. Its opposite is the simulation. Jeffrey Russell, uh, in a book uh, came out in 1986, uh, Mephistopheles, The Devil in the Modern World. He talks about the modern conception of evil, of course, being very different from what we've been talking about here. Um, changing conceptions, perceptions that have come, developed over the years, 
self-interest, general secularization. But the most normal and most common response to an evil presence is a feeling of agony, dread, desperation, depression, fear, alienation. But this is purely subjective. Evil in modern thought. Um, Neiman came out in 2002. Again, argues something else. That evil is attached to events that involve large numbers of people, like political crimes. It's not misfortune or bad luck. It has to be voluntary. It has to be a, a moral matter. Like Russell would say, there's a metaphysical to natural evil. They're inherent to the structure of the world, but they're not moral issues. Metaphysical evil is inherent in, in, in nature, in the fallen nature. It's the gap between essence and existence. The fact that we have free will, the fact that our um, will to resist isn't perfect, that we may be perfect in the noumenal world, our belief system may be perfectly um, rational, but we don't live in the noumenal world, we live in the phenomenal world. I mean, all things don't live up to their potential, and everything's imperfect. Natural evil refers to disasters, you know, acts of God, they're destructive. But none of these are a moral question. And they're usually a part of both classical and even the modern conceptions of evil, but they're not comprehensive. But moderns have changed this. They've attempted to eradicate this. Moderns hold that evil behavior is a result of mental illness, uh, poor upbringing, something external to the agent. That no one would voluntarily commit an evil act knowingly. Ideology in political terms. The harbinger of evil. Marxism was. They're justified not as evil, but the slaughter of the communist state was a way that they cleared the field for inevitable human progress in science. Collateral damage, in other words. Now, you can't talk about evil without talking about the concept of the world. The world, in this sense, is similar to worldly or secular. It refers to the power structure that exists everywhere. Power of money, access to power, and the ruthlessness it requires to get both. It's not the world in the sense of creation. But without knowing the definition, it doesn't make any sense. I'm talking about, um, uh, in, um, well, from Gregory Palamas, he says, Come out from your country and your people into the land I shall show you. This is from Genesis. The saying contains within it the mystery of the cross because it corresponds exactly with Paul, who boasting in the cross says the world has been crucified to me. In truth, for him who has left his country, never to return, his homeland and world according to the flesh have been put to death and destroyed. And this is the cross, as Gregory in homily 11. The cross is ritual death. In the ancient world, to remove oneself from the traditional ties of the community was actually the definition of death. Today, of course, it means you're not breathing anymore. So you can die and still be breathing in the ancient medieval understanding of things. Death wasn't merely not breathing anymore but severing ties that make life possible. So the first reason is to say that the cross was graphic proof of the fact that true followers of Christ will be hated. They'll be dead in the sense that they'll lose all ties with the mundane world. St. John Chrysostom says, Freedom from corruption, in any event, would have been joined to freedom from the passions. In the presence of passionlessness, sin would have no place. But since they did sin, they were surrendered to corruption. Having become corrupt, they begat offspring like unto themselves. But desires, fears, pleasures accompany them who are in this likeness. Reason wars against these passions, and winning is proclaimed victorious. But suffering defeat, it is put to shame. A commentary on Psalm 50. That's not different from Gregory Palamos. St. John here is holding that the cross shows an image of a total lack of ego, the lack of selfishness. Sin is passion, the blind forces of nature operating through the human person. Passions in theology refer to being controlled by something, he said. Christ was never, um, uh, Christ didn't show these passions because these passions have to be out of control. Christ was angry. He was angry pretty much the whole time he was alive, but for a very specific reason. But the further point is that death is the ultimate fear for worldly people. It's the worst thing there is. But Christians have a long list of things that are far worse than death, including apostasy, which is the root of sin. Fear of death is a reason for civilization. Man seeks to surround himself with the comforts of civilization so as to continually cheat death. Because we're contingent beings, only partly free, we want to ground ourselves in civilization and logic and everything that comes from that. 
That conceptual apparatus is part of the fallen world that it interrupts immediate connection with divinity. Before the fall, Adam immediately knew the essence of things and who God is. That was never a question. He had a communion with God that didn't require words and phrases and, and ideas, cognitive steps. But after the fall, his successors thought to control nature through the use of formal concepts. So death in this sense means nothing to fear. Christ met death face to face and the latter was defeated. Now death often refers to a place where souls go. Hades, which is not hell, the realm of semi-existence. Death is a location of a sort, the contents of which were liberated through Christ's death. The manner of death, again, shows a complete lack of care for any kind of prestige or, or situation. The cross was a form of execution meant for the worst of sinners. It's like being a child molester today. Christ's humility was so great that he didn't even care for that kind of accusation. He didn't have to die on the cross. It would imply that Christ had no freedom, but he had full freedom. The issue, the issue is the nature of the cross. It's a form of ritual humiliation that is extremely painful. Given the nature of communal ties in that era, to be ritually mocked this way and led to the death reserved for the worst of the worst shows what the truth is. Constant hatred for the world. Rejection and contempt for what the world thinks is true and good. Gregory of Constantinople or St. Gregory Nazianzus says, Man must be sanctified by the humanity of God, that he might deliver us himself and overcome the tyrant, and draw us to himself by the mediation of his Son, who also providentially affected this to the honor of the Father, whom it is manifest and he obeys all things. Such are the things concerning Christ, but as for the greater part, let it be reverenced with silence. Man was bound to sin, in other words. Prior to Christ, there was no good act, no, no act good in itself. All good actions were motivated by base things, the popularity or looking good, whatever it is. Christ showed the world the first totally dispassionate action. Sin, considered as a debt, was taken on by Christ not merely on the cross, but also in the garden. Christ's sufferings there cannot be ignored. It was there in the garden where every sin that's ever committed, or ever will be committed, weighed down on Christ completely in its fullness. There are two ways to conceive of evil when it refers to the cross here. Uh, as a matter of judicial recompense, uh, this is a popular concept in the West, that Christ somehow appeases the angry father with his own blood. And so doing, the sin of the world is destroyed and death is spoiled. The other way to view it is a means of showing how man should live. This is more significant. In him. And but both, both conceptions exist often at the same time, both the East and the West. You can't put one to the other. Um, both exist in both civilizations, in both the Catholic world and the Orthodox world, uh, at the same time, often by the same writers. Um, the cross in the second sense, it doesn't cancel the concept of reconciliation, but it shows the heights of virtue, rather than the conquest of vice. Christ took upon himself all the world's sins in the Garden. Westerners often forget what happened in the Garden of Eden. I'm sorry, what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is the opposite of life in the Garden of Eden. The cross has a different purpose in this respect. It was a graphic reminder of what being a Christian means. The suffering was far worse in the Garden than it was on the cross. But the idea of the cross as recompense, that somehow, you know, God the Father is bloodthirsty and he needs, you know, Christ's blood to be satisfied, and he'll damn everyone until his wrath is appeased, that's an extreme conception, but it ascribes such anger to God the Father, who is, in fact, incapable of human emotion. Christ took on that role, and he wept, you know, everything everything was sin and laughter. He, Christ never smiled or laughed. The implication is that the Father is so irrational that he just cannot wait to damn as many souls as possible until he gets enough blood, including from his own son. And this is, you know, this is what atheists think Christianity is. But unfortunately, this is not uncommon among um, Christian writers, even in the ancient world. But the second conception of the cross is far more important. At the time of Christ's incarnation, human nature was joined with the divine. There are two natures in communion, not two combined natures, as the Benefisites would put it. These natures remain separate because human freedom has to be retained. Human nature and divine nature are separate, but of course related. The alternative, of course, is either total separation or absorption. So we can go 
uh, further and hold that the Incarnation itself was a means of joining humanity, sins and all, to the perfection of divinity. The Garden was a culmination of that, a reversal of what happened at Eden. The cross shows the wages of sin, but in and of itself does not free man from sin. Christ's existence does that, not the cross in isolation. Man received the propensity for sin from Adam. The fall of man from communion with, with the world uh, and, and God to the dominion over it. There's no inherited guilt in that sense. Christ atoned for all of humanity's sins. Our justification comes through the application of that to daily life. So Christ joining our nature to his destroyed sins by definition. The cross, Christ brought human nature face to face with death. Then, of course, 40 days later, he ascended to heaven. This means that our human nature is sitting on the throne next to God the Father. That is, however, spiritual and not physical, because our bodies and souls um, have to be judged as a combination. That's why there are two judgments. The one is the soul, the other is body and soul. It's very difficult to judge the soul without the body that actually acts as this instrument. In fact, it doesn't make much sense. But the atonement idea doesn't cancel freedom, nor does it call us righteous regardless of what we do. It's the call for humanity to radically alter its inner life in such a way that the presence of God can penetrate everything, both personally and collectively. It requires work that takes directly from the cross, the ability to handle pain and humiliation, the lack of care for the self, selfless service and the realization that the world is foreign to us. And when I say world, I'm talking about existing power relations. What it considers important, its priorities, what it sees as significant, what, what it views as prestigious. Seeking power, or seeking um, reputation. If this is consistently manifest by our actions, then the final stage, which is sanctification or deification, is our ultimate salvation. But it also implies that salvation is something that happens in this life, not just in the next. And the last thing, of course, and I mentioned this before, is Nikolai Berdyev. The existential idea is one of the most one of the most convincing and, and easy to grasp the concept of, of evil and our role in the world. We do experience our own freedom, which can't spring from anything material. There is no real distinction between consciousness and freedom, yet there is between freedom and thought, as well as freedom and matter. Evil can be found in matter as well as spirit and soul. It all depends on choices, of which there are only two. To exist in and for material objects, which includes, you know, ideology, you know, natural science, whatever, or to live in and for the spiritual realm, including anything that's freely chosen and does not assume a physical and hence unfree form. Um, Berdyaev's um, existentialism is, is eccentric. His understanding of salvation and immortality. So he says that sin is a reconciliation of freedom with the world. That is, when the spirit gives up its struggle for freedom and sinks into the mediocrity of the mass of received opinions and average ideas, it dies. Its immortality might still exist, but it's ephemeral and formal. On the other hand, immortality is guaranteed by the life dedicated to spirit, which is pure labor, creativity in the best sense. Conformity and creativity, real work, real labor, are opposites. There's nothing special about the institutions and ideas of this or any other era. To conform is a non-intellectual act. It's merely an act of subservience. It's accepted because it's a present, uh, mainstream, well-systematized. All our answers are already ready-made and given to us. It's easy that way. 1932, he wrote Two Concepts of Christianity, which is his uh, famed uh, essay in this. And he says, Man remains man. In him there is no eternal basis. He is both creation of God, bearing within himself the image and likeness of God, but also sinful and fallen. He is twofold, being lofty and lowly. In him is light and darkness. He is the point of intersection of two worlds. The argument is that immortality is not the essential nature of spirit. It is a result of conduct. Spirit serves matter. Doctrine, ideology, or some other manufactured set of ideas has no understanding of eternity. Such a will only knows the temporary and transient. When the soul becomes aware of the spirit and seeks to serve it in its ends, then the composite man is hence immortal. The inner man, Berdyaev calls the eternal man, suggesting that the spirit alone, when properly nurtured, 
remains immortal. There is no real distinction between freedom and immortality, since such an object or entity like the conscious, like the conscious mind can't die. It does not have parts and doesn't have a physical form. It's a negative proof, but it shows Berdyaev beginning to formulate some concept of immortality, one that he didn't really live long enough to uh, complete. Ultimately, it comes down to freedom. It's the one, not freedom in the, in the vulgar sense. It's the one object of which we're directly aware. We're aware of our conscious universality. Um, consciousness is something that we are immediately aware of. At the same time, we're aware of its negation. The pull of the will to that which is easy, easy, mediocre, and rationalized. Standardization is the ultimate form of objectification, and in Berdyer's mind, the definition of death. By beginning with this primordial experience, our own freedom and consciousness, Berdyer's appeal is, is that everything is deduced from it. Freedom and consciousness are not material. Therefore, freedom is spiritual. The external world is largely material, and we see that it is determined and can't be free. Freedom and materiality, that materiality does not matter, by the way. Materiality is unfree and dead. Freedom is the refusal to accept the given, which is the same thing as rejection of the world. Given realities are not eternal. They're transitory, always changing, and hence false and mortal. Freedom alone is immaterial. It's free and hence immortal. Spirit can be quenched, to use his word. However, um, through repeated acts of bad faith or the refusal to accept more responsibility and hide behind ideologies or scientific fads, immortality is earned in life. This is a the beginning, anyway, of an understanding of our current situation, really, in any situation. Um, I wanted to use Numbers 25 as a very graphic example of what we're up against. Numbers 25 is something that is worth going over again and again. It's really about one of the most powerful weapons of Antichrist against Israel. You know, pornography, the cult of sex, American dating norms, self-esteem issues, these are forms of control and bondage, not liberation. And even secular intellectuals in the 17th and 18th century knew the Old Testament from memory. It's only today that the actual moral content of the faith is completely rejected. Sex is a weapon when it's removed from its natural context. And I could say the same for work, for labor, for money, or anything else. Modern men have their self-esteem controlled, not by physicality, not by thought, crafts, or trades, but whether or not they receive a level of social prestige, which usually comes down to whether how many hot girls like them. The brainwashing starts early, and this is where the invasion of these unreal images come from. Um, Numbers 25 shows us how sex is a weapon and why the sexual revolution was so destructive. The Moabites used these women not to liberate Israel, but explicitly to destroy them. God knows, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with sexuality or, or, or the female form. Perish the thought. However, it can be used as a weapon. The way that it's used today is exclusively used as a weapon. When the Tel Aviv government in Israel began pumping pornography into the Gaza Strip uh, starting about 20 years ago. They weren't trying to liberate them. They were trying to enslave them. The same thing goes for the Moabites in the Book of Numbers, chapter 25. This is the chaotic nature of evil, or the nature of images. What is unreal that we are absolutely convinced is real. Our job is another difference. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.